Five Live Boxing. So welcome to Five Live Boxing, another unified, that's all four belts fight. This time, it was, I want to say this, the most loved boxer on the planet. Yes, Katie Taylor, the real hero. Oh boy. Anyway, Katie Taylor was defending all four of her lightweight belts against previously unbeaten Argentinian Karen Elizabeth Carabajal. Katie Taylor won comfortably. It was at Wembley. It was easy. Okay, sure. She's that good, to be perfectly honest with you. Anyway, I spoke to her in the ring, and Eddie Hearn also joined us in the ring to have a little chat about what's going on now, or what will be going on now for Katie. Then Eddie also spoke to me about the situation, the ongoing saga, and yes, it is a saga involving Connor Ben. In fact, it was quite an emotional Eddie Hearn talking to me about that situation. In fact, there seems to be installments daily on that whole situation. Eddie cleared the air in many ways, and next Saturday in Abu Dhabi, two British boxers are in world title fights. Dimitri Buvel was at the top of the bill, and Tokyo gold medal winner Galau Yafai is in his third fight. And it's a decently tricky fight, especially for his third one. Well, I went to Sheffield to speak to him. Now that, my friend, is a big show. I'm Steve Bunce, and this is Five Live Boxing. Now, I'm joined by Barry Jones. He's a regular on this show. And first of all, Barry, um, let's deal with Katie Taylor. Um, 10 rounds, comfortable decision, as good as a shutout. One or two judges gave a mercy vote, as far as I'm concerned, for Carabajal. What was your impression from it? I think she was a clear winner, of course, but she wasn't, I don't think it was vintage Katie Taylor. But I would also say, nor was Katie Taylor against Sharapov. Sharapova before she boxed Manda Serrano either, so maybe she just literally goes to the level of her opponents. But I still have that concern, Steve, and I have to, I said it before that you know, that Serrano fight might have taken a little bit out of her, and because she looked a little bit flat tonight, and that could be a number of things, but it might just be that she just come off a really grueling, you know, yeah. and, and we were there, a horribly grueling fight. Oh, and also wonder, I wonder what it's like when you're preparing for a fight when basically everyone said, okay, it's great, Katie's fighting, everyone loves her, but this girl's only a super featherweight. She might be unbeaten, but she's never been anywhere near anything like Katie Taylor. She's never even fought outside of Argentina. And so she's massively dismissed, massive underdog. Katie's a massive bet in odds on favour. I wonder if that can get you. It can certainly take away your hunger. It does. It has to. And also, she was tall and awkward, and that messes with and your rhythm. And she used tall and awkward yeah, well. Yeah, she, she really did. And so that can, that can mess with your rhythm a little bit. I understand that. So she, to get your timing and your distance, she was struggling. But, the, but Katie Taylor before, when she struggled with the distance, she'd get that bounce in her step, in and out movement, and that would get her rhythm back and she would fire off that. And she's more flat-footed now. And it might be because she just thought she'd walk through this girl. And I think that's another thing. She, I think she tried to knock her out early. Oh yeah, the first and, two or three rounds yeah, without And then couldn't, and maybe, you know, that again, you just had to get your rhythm back. So it was a listen, she won easy enough, and I don't know the argument there, but I just think, no, we, we, we hold her now, unfortunately, to a higher standard. Yeah. And that's because and she's, she's produced so many good performances, and certainly the last one, that every fight now, she's judged from her best displays. Yeah. So, so Barry, the, the, one, the one thing that struck me was that the girl took a lot of good shots, okay? And, 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 and with regards to Katie Taylor being slightly more flat-footed, I think she, she, she did what she knew she could do. She didn't have to move that much, and she, she didn't really have to step up a gear. She won it with a few jabs and a few right crosses and a few lift hooks, and that happens. Yes, of course, you know, but, yeah, course, yeah again, but I, again, I'm just still judging her from, because she is that good. So like, Two Delphine Pursuit fights, a great rematch with Natasha Jonas and Amanda Serrano in three or four years. Should be enough for anybody to have an easy night, shouldn't it? It is enough for everyone, of course it is. And, but no, the, more important, the most important thing is she got the win. It was, it was, it was risk-free. It was, it was comfortable. There was no hassle there. Yeah. And she moves on to hopefully, hopefully yeah. that bigger fight that, that, that she's been talking about. Well, what well, she was talking about in the ring, and I'm sure you heard it because I know that yeah. they, they talked about it but, uh, as well. Um, was that whole Croke Park thing. 80,000 people. Hopefully Serrano in the opposite corner. If not someone uh, Serrano-ish, i.e. someone that could test her. Because I asked her, did you want to test? Because let's get it right, Barry. She could sell out Croke Park if she was shadow boxing. Yes, of course. She'd get 80,000 people uh, paying to watch a shadow box. Not just because it's her, because it hasn't been in professional boxing in Southern Ireland since 2014, maybe? 15? About, it's got, it's, yeah, 15 or 16, It's, it's about yeah. that. So, so it's such a long time. And who better to bring it back than Katie Taylor, yeah. for one. 
And also there's other fights here, you know, Chantelle Cameron's boxing Jessica McCaskill, the winner of that fight, could come down in weight, I'm sure, or she could go up, as she already has before. And that's a great fight. Yeah. But Katie Taylor sells anyway. So, as we found out tonight, I should, say, I yeah, should add. Yeah, as we did. Well, I'm, I'm, we're going to hear from her. And, and after that, we'll have a little chat. We'll, uh, uh, we'll have a little summary of what she said. Also, we'll have a quick look at the rest of the bill here at Wembley, where the atmosphere was absolutely sensational. It felt like 20,000 in here tonight and not seven or eight or 9,000. Anyway, I climbed up in the ring afterwards and spoke to Katie. Eddie Hearn joins us at the end. Here's Katie Taylor in the ring at Wembley, less than six or seven minutes after having her hand raised as she retained all four of her lightweight world championship belts. Yeah, she was obviously very, very tough, very organized, very long and, and dangly, and um, I thought it was a great exhibition. Um, I just had to stay in the outside, stay smart, and, and box for a change, ra rather than staying there and fighting them. Um, I think I used my brain probably a bit more tonight, which was, which is what I needed to do. A good 10 rounds. Now, there's been lots of talk here. Eddie's been talking about it. The fans are talking about it on the way here, about something big in Dublin. What can you say about 80,000 at Croke Park? I think that's the only thing that could top what happened in Madison Square Garden, really. 80,000 people in my home, uh, um, my home in Ireland. Um, six years of pro is crazy that I haven't actually bought there. So uh, the thought of fighting in a pro park is, is so exciting for me. That would be the biggest event in, uh, in possibly Irish sport in history. And who's in the other corner? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, I hope it's Amanda Serrano, but uh, regardless of who it is, I think we can set out Madison Square Garden and there's no shortage of big fights out there. Can you remember your last fight in Ireland? Yeah. When was it? Because no, I can't find it easily. Yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, my last fight, gosh, I can't even remember, Steve. Uh, but, uh, Three or or some of the, the ones we've done there. Maybe it was the one that close shows or something. Um, yeah, I, I can't. How mad is that? It's crazy. Uh, and do you remember being interviewed, uh, sorry, introduced at that Bernard Dunn fight that time when Bono and all of those people were at ringside and you were the last? But do you remember that? So that's what you've got to look forward to, that kind of reception. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's going to be the loudest event in history, I think. Imagine um, the, the Irish fans are passionate, um, the most passionate fans in the world. And, um, it's just it's it going to be an amazing event and we can make it happen, we will make it happen and everyone involved is just very, very confident it is going to happen. Katie, okay, thanks for your time. No cuts, no bruises, hardly any marks. It's beautiful to see you looking so good. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks very much. much. Eddie, if I could just, just a couple of seconds. Um, thanks very much. First of all, um, Katie there went through, won, won the 10 rounds comfortably, possibly wasn't her most exciting, exhilarating performance, but that doesn't matter with what we've got coming up in Croke Park, does it? But also, when it's 21-0 against 19-0, they're, they're tough fights, you know, especially when you know, these opponents come in with everything to gain, and everyone expects Katie to win every round, which she pretty much did anyway, but, you know, it's, it's difficult to sometimes shine coming off the back of Madison Square Garden. Yeah. She boxed well. She got her job done, but you know, ultimately we know what's coming next, and that's Ireland. You know, and it's it's going to be something they've never seen before. You know, no one deserves it more than Katie Taylor. It's an absolute must for her next fight. And and Elliot, re reading between the lines and talking to her, she wants that to be a test, a real test, a Serrano-style yeah. fight. Serrano, you know, Serrano is a fitting fight for Croke Park. You got next week, you got on this incredible run of female fight, Chantel Cameron against Jessica McCaskill for the Undisputed could be, the, right could be the best, you know, that's, that's, that's right up there. The winner of that could be an option, Alicia Baumgarten could be an option, but Serrano rematch, you know, with our friend Jake Paul and everything, like it would be something so, so special and so many good Irish fighters coming through. Gary Cully could be in a world title time that comes around next summer, so, you know, it would be a massive night. Everyone knows how much he deserves it, but like, as I said, wherever, whoever, Ireland is next. So a very sort of, well, it's very serious, Katie Taylor. That's what you'd expect, Barry. But, but what, 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 I, what I got there was that she did, and this is an odd thing to say for Katie Taylor, she did enough to win. She, what, she doesn't have to, I know that it was a great atmosphere in here, but she just did enough to win. She was sensible. She was unmarked. And I think she liked being sensible and unmarked. Yeah. <laughs> Bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, dare she? No. What did she think she's I'm doing? Dare Katie I'm, not I'm, having, dare. I'm not having that. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> she deserves an easy run. Let's be honest. She's had no. But it's yeah. She's a, she's a, she knows what she's doing, yeah. and and her ring management is, is fantastic. Yeah. So she she makes whatever's happening. Whether she's whether she, I thought she was flat. I thought she was flat. But a sign of a really good fighter, a great fighter, is you can be flat and still win yeah. quite comfortably. Yeah. And what's what's so interesting also, and Eddie mentioned it there and he's absolutely right, was that you've got an unbeaten fighter coming in. 
an unbeaten girl who's going to give up just to go 10 rounds is a victory to push and she was in, let's get away she was in the 10 rounds she, she did she did in my opinion she lost all of them but she was in the 10 rounds this was this is a girl now who's, really, who's, who's let's be honest and i'm over exaggerating usually boxing legend centers with 50 people in there yeah, yeah. and now she's boxing in like in front of seven or thousand people but it sounds like you said sounds like 20,000 people no she's going to put on a very best performance and be the most elusive she can possibly be between us, there might be more talk of leisure centres with 50 or 60 people a little later in the pod. I can't say too much more. That's to come out. But just, just quickly, one thing that struck me, I was sitting with, with Manny uh, at ringside, when he was, he was kipping, I was trying to wake him up every now and again, who films all the stuff for us, is that, 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 that now Carabajal, wouldn't you bring her back? Let her fight, let's be cheeky, it's an aggressive business at the moment. Let her fight, let her fight Caroline Dubois, why not? I'm being honest. <laughs> well, it might be a step. It might be a bit of a step up for Duba Callum Dubai right now, to be honest. You know, I think because you know I, she showed. It's a test. She... We saw with Sandy Ryan, Barry. Sorry for interrupting. Where Sandy Ryan stepped up against the Argentinian and lost, then had the rematch and beat her. It was a step too far. It didn't hurt her. She came back a better fighter over the next ten rounds. Yeah, but Caroline's still young. I think I think that's important. I mean, we, we forget that sometimes how young she really is. So I think a few I more agree. A, few, a few more learn if I say, it, Steve. Yeah. You get too excited, mate, after a big night out. No, you? listen. Sometimes I just keep pushing the fights like that. Right. Barry, just quickly on the rest of the card. First of all, I've got to say, um, there's a young man who trains in um, Essex with Mark Tibbs called Johnny Fisher. We've mentioned him before on the pod, and we're not kidding. He's a, he's a big heavyweight. He's one of the top lead, top chasing pack. He's 7-0 and zero now. He took care of, of his opponent tonight in under a round. But what's more, Barry, he sold individually 2,000 tickets, literally hand on hand, going around. And it's not just that. This crowd love him. He's got a couple of songs that they, they sing. And Barry, I've got to say this. I think Johnny Fisher can fight, mate. I think for a big old heavyweight, I think for a seven-bout novice heavyweight, I like what he's what he's doing, and I like what Mark and Jimmy Tibbs are doing with him. I do. I'm, I'm a big fan. Yeah, he's still. I think he's still a little bit crude right now. Yeah. But because he got such a big right hand, he wants to bowl it over. And by the way, the first knockdown, he bowled it over so much it hit the kid on the back of the head. <laughs> he went right over his head, hit them on the back of the head. But he's powerful. And he's got, and uh, by the way, if I, if I was a promoter, let's just pretend for a minute, he would be on every single show I do. I yeah, know, yeah. Every single show. Three times a month. Old school, 50 star. He, he's fun to watch and he, and he sells loads of tickets and they stay. Yeah, that, don't That's they important, did, they? they stay. Well, it's, it's funny, it's funny because I was sitting here and I was thinking, please don't go because also what they were, they were all over. So there was 20 there, 20 there, 20 there. It was a good house in there tonight, seven or 8,000 or whatever. And, and, and I thought if they all leave, there's going to be these horrible patches all over. And I think to a man and a woman, lots of women, I think they did all stuff. That's Johnny Fisher. But... Let, let's just be a bit respectful tonight to one of the great European fighters from the last 50 years. He's Spanish, but we love him here. Kiko Martinez. I mean, I got up and went to see him backstage. I got all emotional, and he told his translator he remembers me. And I said I was at the Bernard Dunn fight, and his eyes lit up. That was about 17 and a half, 20 years ago or something. Kiko Martinez, I put it to you, Barry Jones, is well, he's a wonder. He's a pure boxing wonder. It was around, and I haven't got the, the date to me, it was around about 2015. And I remember saying, yeah, he, he's, he's, on the, he's on the decline now, that's it now. He'll be, he'll, be, he'll be fodder. He'll be a gatekeeper for all these young prospects looking for world title shots. <laughs> I've said some silly, silly things in my time, but that was one of that goes up there with the best of them, unfortunately, because he just, he just uh, evergreens the word. Yeah. I've used it before. It, it, it literally should be stamped on his forehead. Uh, and, He's unbelievable. And, 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 and he, he stopped Jordan Gill tonight, I think, in the fourth round, or the referee stopped it, and, and Dave Cole went in the corner through the tower, and Jordan Gill had been down four times. Jordan Gill's gone off to have for a routine check in hospital, which is, which is standard. It was all a bit emotional backstage. Now, I don't have Kiko Martinez's stats, all of his stats in front of me. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, he won the European title at his second weight for the fifth time tonight. He's won a couple of world titles at two weights. He's been involved in some absolute unbelievable blockbusters. And I still don't think he gets the respect in Spain. Kiko Martinez, we salute you. Breath of fresh air, Kiko Martinez. Now, Barry, I know that you've been keen, keenly watching the Conor Ben saga as it unfolds. Uh, I'm not sure if you were meant to work that weekend when the fight was cancelled. We were all meant to work. Conor Ben failing a, um, a routine drug test and the fight eventually getting pulled. Lots of accusations, lots of screaming. 
And in fact, it was all a little bit ongoing. It was all a little bit ugly. It was, it was definitely a saga, as I mentioned. So I caught up with Eddie a bit earlier. And, and the first thing I asked him was how he gauged the reception to more and more truth leaking out over the Connor Ben fouled sample. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. Um, there's a lot of people that presume Conor Ben is guilty before hearing any kind of trial and I understand that you know sometimes normally it should be innocent until proven guilty but sometime in, in this environment it's guilty until proved innocent and I, and I actually understand that as well you know um, you know I spoke to Robert Smith tonight from the board look they've been the board have known about everything exactly the same moments we've known about everything they're the regulatory body you know they, they called him to a hearing they wanted to charge him with something not related to a doping ban which he felt was very unreasonable. He wants to take his fight to a higher level. And that fight now is so important because he can't fight again until he has that fight. You know, he could box in so many different jurisdictions now. It's not, it's not right. We wouldn't allow that. And, and he doesn't want to allow that because he's got a lot of people to convince, you know. Um, it's easy for me to give my belief of his innocence, but he needs to convince the public and he needs to convince the authorities and he's got a big fight on his hands. Well, the, the way it works, as you know, with, with, drug, with, with the drug test in, in boxing, is that you can be guilty of taking the substance, which is it, the substance is there, that, that, that we can't deny that, uh, but you can be innocent of ingesting it. So that's, that's clearly what, what, what is, class, that's clearly the road is going down. Yes, and of course that's one thing, but you have to prove where that come from, Absolutely. and that's the difficulty here that he has. You know the science behind the tests, and you know at the end of the day, people aren't going to believe anything that, that comes out of his mouth at the moment, unfortunately. But you we've, understand, you understand? I do, I do. But we've seen this. I, I still believe in giving people the opportunity for so the facts I. to come out. Ultimately, we've seen the science. We've spoke to the experts. They believe there's a very strong case for contamination because of the minute levels in these tests. But at the same time, you are one million percent right. And I said this to the young man when he was crying in my office. It's in your system. We have to find out why and how, but it's still in there. And ultimately, it could lead to a ban. You know, unless he gets reprieved, which, you know, again, has to find a reason to, to allow that jury to reprieve him, he may receive a ban here. It could be three months, six months, a year. It could be, you know, but ultimately, let's get on with it. Yeah. Because let's that's, you know, we, we need to, and I'm not saying let's draw a line under this so we can, you know, go, oh forget about it because it won't be forgotten about but it needs to be dealt with and, and hopefully that process is now underway. Now the process is now underway and you've mentioned you've spoken to Robert Smith. Is there any way that the board and Connor can patch things up in the yeah, future? And, and because of the hopefully. fight that Connor will be on now. I mean look at you know, Tyson Fury had an almost identical situation Absolutely. where he decided not to renew his British Boxing Board of Control. Not a, lot, not a lot of people talk about that but anyway. I so, try to. Yeah but it's, it's fact and now he's boxing in Britain. He still doesn't have a British Boxing Board of Control license, but you know, Conor Ben could go out now and get a, a license with various different commissions. That's fine, but he must go through a hearing process first. Like because Tyson Fury did. Yeah, but this isn't about slipping through the system and trying to be clever. This is about dealing with a situation, taking your licks if you get them, and moving on. Because that's the only way people will accept him returning to the ring. And I think he wants to clear that up for himself and his own reputation. How is he now compared to the kid you had squirming and crying on the floor and pleading his innocence in your office? Honestly, how, 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 how is he now? Absolutely dreadful. Dreadful. I mean... A, a completely broken young man, you know, and people will listen to this and go, good, I don't care, because that's the world we live in. But as I say, if he's innocent, if he is, then please give him the respect when it all comes out, because we believe he is. Now listen, he's our friend, you know, he's almost part of family. You've got Tony Sims, you know Tony Sims, Buncey, Nigel Ben, you know, all these people. And it's a very difficult time for him, but that's life, whether they've been unlucky, whether they're guilty, we don't think so, but it'll all come out. But right now, he's a, you know, he's a broken young man, but you know, that's unfortunately the position he's in. Well, so as we come towards the end of the month, when it all happened, when it all went down, is there, can you put a time, de a deadline on it? Or not a deadline, can you put like a time scale on it? Do you think it'll be semi-resolved, or there'll be a hearing, or there'll be revelation? I mean, What's your gut feeling? As soon as possible. I mean, look, he, the kid wants to resume his career, and if he has to serve a ban, you know, he'll want that ban to come into effect as soon as possible. Cool. So this is a massively documented case, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's huge, hugely yeah. high profile globally, and not good for the sport of boxing, and difficult for all of us, especially the British Boxing Board of Control, who ultimately govern the situation and the sport and you know they've had to go through a process as well we've we've got the blame as always but as always we will let the board decide what to do and, and we did in that case as well and finally Eddie and thanks so much for your time and I know a busy on a night like this finally 
Were you surprised by the vitriol, by the outburst, by the almost blanket condemnation that came in that 48 hours immediately after the revelations? Were you surprised by them? You know, sometimes the country don't really amaze me because they like to, to bring down the successful, if you like, and, and shoot them down from the hip. But at the same time, I will say this, ultimately, when you do fail a test and you are right, it's in your system, somehow, some way. So in that respect, whatever way you want to look at it, you are guilty. Now you can be unlucky, it could not be your fault, you could have not intentionally ingested it, in which case this is a horrific situation for Conor Ben. But all I'm saying is, is just maybe, maybe it is. And you know, ultimately, you know, let, let's, let's hear that out in public. But I'll tell you one thing about this situation. Conor Ben had the opportunity to lie, right? They sat down, you know, people said to him, you know, ultimately, you've got to build a case here. So, is, you know, is your wife on any fertility treatment? No, she's not. I'm sure people said to him, say she is. But they call it mixed, medi mixed okay. up medication. His exact words to me, I don't want to lie. You know, this is a man actually of, of, of faith and of God. Not that that should matter in a court of law. But what I am saying is this, he didn't want to make up an excuse. He wants to be honest with people. He wants to go through the process. So he didn't take his wife's fertility drug. She wasn't on any fertility, you know, so, and all of those excuses could have been laid out. He wants to be honest and go through the process, give him the chance to be heard. So a, um, a fairly raw Eddie Hearn there. The line I want to pick up on first, Barry, is when I asked him how Connor was. Now, I don't think Connor's doing very well, but I was expecting Eddie to say, no, he's doing okay, but you heard him say there, the kid is suffering. The kid is broken, and I'll pick up on the other point. In our business, it seems it's the reverse of the way the world works. In our business, you're guilty until you're proven innocent, as opposed to being innocent until you're proven guilty. It's not an easy situation, I admit. It's not an easy situation. See, the, the problem you have is, like, and you'd like to think that he is innocent, and and I hope that he is. But it's it's hard to, to explain how it's, how the drugs got into his system. And there are, and listen, we, we spoke about before. There are there have been cases, I think, with a UFC guy and, and, and you know, where and a cyclist. There's a, and cyclist. a cyclist, yeah, where, where mixed contamination when they've used the same bowl or something yeah. to yeah. to mix up the the ingredients for different things. But it's it feels like a stretch. That's the truth of it. Yeah. No, I was shocked when Conor Ben, when, when Conor Ben was supposed he failed the drug test Same because here. he didn't seem like the kind of kid to do it. Absolutely. But as we've learned in our business, you never really know anybody. Absolutely. So, yeah, and I understand why he's throwing his British boxing ball license away because if he genuinely believes or knows that he's innocent and no one will believe him, then he's gone, well, I just want nothing to do with none of you. Yeah. And, but it doesn't look good. That, the fact that he gives him a British boxing ball license doesn't look good. On, for his for his case to me. Yeah. One one good thing about Connor at the moment is he's not for no excuses. He's saying I'm innocent. I don't know what it is. I'm not I'm not saying it was contaminated beef. I'm not saying someone spiked my drinks bottle in the gym. I'm not saying I took my wife's tablet by mistake one morning when I was groggy and it was dark. He's saying I'm innocent. Now I'm not saying that's unheard of. Right, but generally people have an excuse or find an excuse. Is that a fair comment? Especially with the, the amount of time they've had and the amount of the amount of people they have around them to f forge a reasonable excuse, which they, which I thought that's what they were doing. Yeah. Kept quiet until they come up with a with a genuine reason. The fact that they haven't makes you tend to think, well, maybe he genuinely did make a mistake or or something happened it, it's not out of his control. But. <laughs> It, it, ultimately, see, whichever way, whether he did the pur whether he did it on purpose or not, he still failed the test. Yeah. So something has to be done about that. And, and you know, no, no, listen, uh, listen. I don't, you know, Eddie, Eddie says there. Everyone knows that. You know, he's going to get a suspension because he had something illegal in his system. That's not up for dispute, and he's guilty of that. The problem will be if he's guilty of ingesting it, and, that, and that's so. Basically, he's using the truth as his defence. And me, for one, I like that. And listen, you know, I want all boxers that foul test to be proved innocent. Of course I do, because I want, I don't want my sport. I keep reading about, oh, it's, oh, it's, you know, nine out of ten boxers, eight out of ten boxers, seven out of ten boxers. This stuff costs thousands. You know, no disrespects. One out of ten boxers couldn't afford this. One out of a hundred boxers can't afford these regimes and these protocols. People forget that. But it's a, it's a it's a nasty it's not a very nice story for our sport. And no, it's not. The sooner we find out whether it's dealt with, I just want to be dealt with. 
I, this, I, live, I, I, I want them to be innocent. Like I want every guy who pr protests his innocence with things like this to be telling the truth. And if that's the case, let's get it done quickly and, and get it out of the way because you know, it doesn't help our sport. You know what, Bell? You could not only be a promoter the way you're talking tonight, the way you kicked into touch my Caroline Dubois fight uh, uh, against Carabao, but you could also be a diplomat by the way you handled that. Full marks. You're getting 10 out of 10 tonight, son. And don't worry, there is, there is, there is a shock and a surprise in store for you. Now, one of the fighters that lost out then, Barry didn't get to work, I didn't get to work, and loads of fighters missed out when that bill was collapsed, when that bill collapsed, rather, was Olympic. Olympic gold medalist from Tokyo, an all-round nice guy, Galau Yafai. He has a fight next week on a brilliant bill in Abu Dhabi. Don't rub it in, Barry. You're going. I'm not. However, I went up to Sheffield to, to speak to Galau, have a little chat with him. And the first thing I asked him is, what was his immediate reaction when he heard that Conor Ben had fouled the test? I was devastated, really. I thought that's going to jeopardise my fight now. Um, obviously, we're all selfish, aren't we? You know, yeah, of course. If, 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 that's the truth. Well, yeah, no. you got to think about yourself. Um, and I just thought, oh, this is fighting jeopardy now. Um, I half knew straight away as soon as I got. Cause I found out when I got to the hotel on the Wednesday, and I got shown an article, and I thought, oh, that's it now. I've trained for nothing for the, for this fight. But ultimately, it is what it is. Yeah. You move on. I've trained. I've got to look for another day, and I and I found one. I got given one, and I can look to that now. When did you find out it'd been moved to Abu Dhabi? Literally about an, an hour after that as well. <laughs> yeah. What, two hours that yeah, was? Yeah, literally. So um, it was like, yep, you're fighting on, on, on Saturday and then it's off now. Okay, you're fighting Abu Dhabi now. So in, in addition to dealing with one fight not being on, even though you got news after a couple of an hour or so that you'd be on again, it's still going to work out at, what, 28 days. So yeah. did you actually have any time off, Galau, or did you just calm down for a day or two? Um, nah, I had like... I think it was a week off, so I hadn't done anything since I got to London on the Wednesday. I think Tuesday was the last day I did anything. anything. Um, so I come back in the gym the following Wednesday. Um, Rob said, have a week off, you, you, you kind of need it. Um, but I think I needed it because, you know, it's a long, it's a long camp, 10, well, it's 10 really, weeks. It's really interesting because I spoke to Savannah Marshall. Yeah. And, of course, she had a 35-day gap after the Queen died okay. between fighting Clarissa, yeah. the fight falling out of bed, I think, on the Friday, yeah. and then fighting, actually fighting Clarissa 35 days later. Yeah. And she said something to me. She said that when I went back home, she said, I went to bed for three days. Yeah. I was exhausted mentally and physically, yeah, just yeah. like I'd had a fight. Yeah, yeah. And I was, I was quite intrigued by that because there was so much, you know, obviously she was top of the bill and it was yeah. a bigger fight. And I'm just wondering if you could, you could understand a little bit of that mentality, the idea that even though you didn't fight, it felt like you did because you were yeah. so close to it. I think a million percent because a lot of people forget it's a training camp, you know, 10, 11 weeks training hard, making weight, running, you know, you're up early, you go to bed early. And the fight's... I thought it's generally the easier bit. And a lot, well, for me at the minute, it might get harder. Um, but generally, it's the easier bit. It's a training for 10, 11 weeks that takes it out of you. You know, mentally, you've been getting ready. You know, your anxiety. Yeah. And if it's a big fight, you're invested in it mentally. Exactly. You? And you've got something going with that person. And I can only imagine that the anxiety that them kind of fighters have, you know, with them kind of fights. I'm only, I'm only small time fights yet. Um, <laughs> but when they get bigger, it's going to be a lot harder. You, you know what I mean? Mentally, not just physically. I've got to ask you about... Your big power phrase. You must be really yeah. missing him because you were together for like about 17 years, it seems. I know. Like a married couple, you're inseparable. But I keep seeing him without you and I keep seeing you without him. <laughs> I can't quite, I can't quite, I can't, I'm getting all emotional just thinking about it. How are you doing that? How are you and Frace doing these days? You know, it is, I only see him on the telly now. <laughs> I only see him on the telly. I seen him Saturday night. Um, because yeah, he was doing bits and pieces for when, when, when the women fought, when, yeah. when, uh, when, when Savannah Marshall and Clarissa fought. He yeah. was working that night, wasn't he? He was, yeah. And Fraser is a great talker, isn't he? He's a great talker. Um, but yeah, I do miss him. But we speak regular. We speak yeah. once, twice a week. Um, I know he's fighting soon, so um, I'll give him a bit of time to you know to keep training and everything. I'll keep, I'll keep my training going and give him a call this week. We're actually going to go. Uh, we're going to go and see him in, in Luff before his fights and. Have a, little, have a little chat with him. And that, one of the things, one of the bonuses of fighting in Abu Dhabi is that your brother Cal's on the bill with you. Yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah, that's something we can't done before. Fight for is that brother. right? Yeah, obviously. I haven't done it before. Cal and Gamal have done it. You know, numerous they've times. Been on the they've been, but you've never done it? Ne never. Never. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so so it's the first time you fought on a bill with, yeah, yeah. with your brother Cal? First time. Um, Gamal and Cal have done it a few times. Yeah, a few times. Think. Yeah, a good few times. Um, yeah. But now we've never done it. Hopefully, one of the one of the, one of the times we can get three of us. Oh, that'd be um, brilliant, wouldn't it? But two of us for now is um, it's good enough. 
Oh, so go, go, going into going into this fight, I'm going to ask you the question I have to ask fighters. Yeah. Where do you want to be in a year's time? Because you're already, you know, if I'd have spoken to you two years ago, you would have said, I'd deal well, Bunsey. I'd love to be a gold medalist. Yeah. And if I'd have spoke to you after the Olympics, say, I'd deal well, I'd like to be fighting 10 rounders. Well, yeah. those things are coming true. Where would you like to be in a year's time? Well, do you know what? It's a good question, Steve. Um, you know, I don't like to look too ahead sometimes. Sometimes I like to just, you know, take one fight at a time. You know, like I've said it before, I could look great in my next fight yeah. and be, you know, looking on bigger things or I could look terrible in my next fight and maybe have to slow down. Um, mm. So you just never know. It just it just, it just, just depends how I look in my fights. Now, with, the, with some of the good good guys that are, uh, that are in the lower weights, you know, light fly, fly, super fly, all those champions that yeah. are out there, You've actually spent some time with Sonny Edwards, didn't yeah. you? I mean, you spent quite a bit, of, quite a bit of time working with Sonny. He was, you know, he's the number one out there yeah. at, at, at fly. What was that like spending time with Sonny? Because you know, Sonny's in a quiet taste on both sides of the road. Yeah. Um, now nah, me and Sonny get along. To be I fair, I know he, he um, loves you. Yeah, we get along well. To be fair, you know, his gym's literally about five minute drive yeah, from here. Yeah. Ten minute walk. Yeah, yeah. ten minute walk. Um, we sparred from our first fight. Uh, we did a lot of ten rounders. Yeah, um, I heard that. Nearly every uh, every week we were sparring. Yeah. Every week, um, Rob would come me and we would spar quietly in a little gym uh, with Grant Smith and Sonny. That's brilliant, um, training, isn't it? Yeah, brilliant it, for you. It, wicked, and they were wicked spars. Um, yeah. And obviously, he's a world champion. He's the OBF world champion. Is IBF, it? yeah. IBF and I, I know he's got a tough fight in the next one against Alvarado, who's, who, yeah, who's a very indeed, good fighter. Yeah. Um, but Sonny's a good fighter, and it's um, yeah. it showed me where I'm at. It shows me where I'm good. at. Good. And also, he got a gauge to see where you. Where, he also got to see where you were. Yeah. yeah. So he's got to know because you know he's a sensible man. He's looking over his shoulder. Yeah. Like, I think I, I don't know about you. I thought that was quite brave of him to bring you in. Yeah, definitely. Could have easily ignored you. You know, uh, you know what? Um, I don't know whether they're just trying to see where I'm at. Um, doesn't, for the future, matter. But doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We, we, we do all benefits. Yeah, we, we're doing the same. We we're sparring him to see where he's at, and you know. But also, we need top sparring, and you yeah. don't get a lot of flow weight in, in, yeah, in the UK. In, in, in the world, you don't. Um, but is it a fight down the line that we can uh, make in the future? Hey, listen, Galau, it's been a absolute pleasure. Nah, thank you. Always a pleasure. It. Appreciate it. Galau, you have fight there. Now, just, just, let me just put it into context, Barry. His first fight was a 10-rounder. His second fight was a 10-rounder. He stopped both of the men. Both of them were guys he could have fought in his 10th, 11th or 12th fight. And this guy is fighting now another Mexican who's only, who's only, lost, who's only lost once. Um, and if I'm not mistaken... Um, I don't think he's been stopped, and he goes eight and ten all of the time, if I'm not mistaken. He's got this, um, I think seven or eight of his last fights have been eight or ten. It's a hard fight, it's a good fight. Yeah. He's fast tracked, proper fast track, Galau. He's 29 years of age, Steve, and for his weight, for his weight and his experience and, and his ability, I think he has to be fast tracked. And I think he wants to be fast tracked. There's no middle of bones about that, but he's up against a guy here. I'm not saying that, no, this guy's not a puncher, but on paper anyway. But the fact that he's done, you no, know, most of his career has been eight and ten rounders. Yeah. It's, it's, I know. <laughs> so is, so is Galal's, of course. But so is Katie Taylor. <laughs> so is Katie Taylor. What I'm saying, the fact that he's had a lot of them, you no, know, means that he knows how to judge the distance, how, no, how to know when to take a rest. He knows how to, no, he knows when to push through, and and that'll be a real test here for Galal. And on the same bill for the first time as his brother Khalid Cow, who used to be a world champion. The two of them telling me that was absolutely unbelievable on the same bill for the first time. Right, let's just crash through the rest of the bill, because I know you're going out there. You've got your, you got your screen block 60. Uh, Dimitri Bivol, top of the bill against Gil Gilberto Ramirez. One's unbeaten in 20, one's unbeaten in 44. Uh, is Bivol too clever, too strong? He is, I think. <laughs> I think he's too clever. I think that I think the movement for I think the you know, movement with the feet is gonna cost Ramirez loads of problems. Ramirez is good, but he, he single jabs his way in and he needs to get over that front foot to hit you with that lead uppercut. I just think Bivol's gonna hit him in straight shots, move away and frustrate him, I think. And the thing with, the thing with Bivol, he won't care about the crowd. No. He won't care about putting on a show. He'll just wanna win, win, win. He, he, he could fight. I mean, literally, when, you know, it was a cauldron when he beat Canelo, by the way, you know, in Canelo's second city, uh, full of Mexican fans. So it was a cauldron there, as you say, blocks them out. Just let me just run through the rest of the card. I love the Chantel Cameron, Jessica McCaskill fight. All those belts up for grabs. Two that Chantel's got, three vacant versions, including the IBO. That's a massive fight, a massive risk for Jessica, and a massive risk for Chantel in some ways, for both. It's a big step up for Chantal Cameron. It's, even though she's a world champion, it, it's, it's, I don't know how well Jessica can do the weight. She's coming back down. She's coming back down from welterweight. You no, know, 
where she beat Brackhouse, by the way. There's no, no, no mean feat there twice. So you know, if, she, if she's still fresh at that weight, it's going to be a real test for Chantal Cameron, who's looked fantastic, by the way. And on the subject of tests, a hard test for Zelfa Barrett. Stepping in for Joe Caldina so ruthlessly and disgracefully had his IBF a super featherweight belt taken from him. It, seems, it seemed fairly harsh to me, but that's neither here nor there. Against Shap Kazan Rakimov, 16 and 0, 13, 16, 0 and 1, 13 stoppages. Zelfa Barrett's only lost to one fight, Zelfa Barrett, and he beat Kiko Martinez, we've seen here tonight. Let me tell you about Rakimov. He beat Fazil. Then he got injured, so Fazil boxed Agawa yeah. for the world title. Agawa yeah. beats Fazil, and then Rakimov st stepped aside to allow Joe Cordina the opportunity to box for the world title. Yeah. And now, and then Joe, that's why Cordina had to box him next. It's a real ass, a hard ass for. for I, I thought this was when, when it was originally Joe Cordina boxing Rakimov. This was a much harder fight than Agawa in my mind. Yeah, Agawa's a bigger puncher. You worry about that, but Rakimov is clever. He's boxed some really good guys, and he's walked through them, Steve. This is this is a I, I, Zelf is good and, and he's snappy and he's got a lovely jab and and it's a real opportunity for him, but I find it hard to see how he can win. Yeah, I, I do as well. That's a massive bill in Abu Dhabi next Saturday, the fifth. Now, Barry, uh, before I let you go, some, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to drift back to the 28th of October, 1992. The legendary, the iconic, the brilliant. The absolutely dreadful, but we still love it. Star Leisure Centre. Splot. Some people say Ely. No longer there, no? No longer there. The thing's gone. There is a plaque on the wall. It was on that particular night that you made your ring debut against what was, I think, unbelievably overmatched for a de debutant. Yeah. What's really interesting, do you remember, you had Welsh royalty, Adrian Morgan, the referee. Yes, yeah, well I do remember him, yeah, I know. He'd refereed some of the best fighters in the last 25 years. You had him for your first fight. And against Con McMullen, you won. Con McMullen was 3-0 and zero and a proper, proper Irish international. He was 3-0 with two knockouts. And yeah, at and the time, I was 18 at the time. I gotta be and you I boxed his ears off. I, did, I boxed well. It was a, it's, a, it's a massive occasion for me. It's huge. And, it, and, and, and I, I put a tweet out the other day, today saying, it, uh, one of the best things I ever did, and maybe one of the worst things I ever did, was turn professional 30 years ago. But it's, I wouldn't change it for the world, ironically. Promoted by Billy Aird on a Billy Wednesday Aird. night. Do you That's know Billy Aird, Billy Aird, one of the loveliest men you ever meet in your life. Yeah, I knew him well. Billy Aird. We ended with Billy Aird. We started with Katie Taylor at a, basically a sold out Wembley. We talked about. Connor Ben's ongoing saga. We talked about Katie Taylor fighting at Croke Park. Then we had a little dabble and look forward to next week in Abu Dhabi where Barry will be. Barry, thank you very much indeed. So Katie Taylor, I called her the most loved boxer on the planet. And I stand by that. I really think that's what she is. She's retained her title. She's moved to 22 and zero. She's got all the belts. What's more, she's got all the class and She's got all the people behind her. It's been a good night for boxing, really, in times that are sometimes difficult and awkward. Barry Jones was excellent. I've been Steve Bunce at Wembley, a Wembley that's now been transformed. All the seats are gone and the ring's nearly gone. What a business. Let's get ready to rumble! Five Live Boxing.